Now, there are restricted regions in the universe where you can have such a planet. Uh, these are discussed uh, by astrobiologists. Uh, perhaps the best known such region or zone is called the circumstellar habitable zone. That's the region around a star where you can have uh, temperature on the surface of a planet sufficient to maintain liquid water. The planetary system itself has to be in a bigger zone called the galactic habitable zone. And I'll have a few more words to say about that a little later. And finally, on the big scale of all, uh, you have to live during the cosmic habitable age, the time in the history of the universe uh, when life is possible. And I'll have, again, a few more words to say about this a little later. Here are some more specifics of the kinds of things you need to have a habitable planet. You need the right kind of terrestrial planet. It can't be too small or too big. You have to hold on to an atmosphere. It has to be big enough to maintain enough heat in the interior to generate a magnetic field that can last a long time. You need to have a stabilizing moon that stabilizes the tilt of the Earth's rotation axis. If we didn't have a large moon like we did, the Earth's rotation axis would wobble over a large range over thousands of years and lead to very large climate variations. You need to have plate tectonics. Plate tectonics cycle the elements of life, in particular cycles carbon. It's part of the carbon silicate cycle, which controls the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It also helps to uh, keep uh, the heat flowing out from the Earth at a uniform rate. You need to have the right kind of atmosphere. Oxygen-rich atmosphere is necessary for complex creatures like us. You need to have the right kind of planetary neighbors, uh, planets like Jupiter that can protect the Earth from too many cometary impacts, the right kind of single star, and so on. I'm going to go into some of these a little later. But you can make a kind of recipe list of the kind of things that you need to make a, a habitable planet. And you'll be tested on this at the end of the lecture today. <laughs> nah. uh, this is a diagram outlining the important factors, uh, starting from the origin of the universe at the very top to uh, life at the very bottom here and all the things that uh, have to go right and their interrelationships over the history of the universe. This is a kind of a very shorthand summary of what we're learning today in the field of astrobiology. The lesson that this is teaching us is that there are many habitability factors that are interrelated. Okay, they depend one on the other. So they form a complex web of interdependencies. And so you have such things as the uh, mass of the Earth uh, affecting how, how long it maintains internal heat uh, and how much it can hold on to the atmosphere and, uh, and oceans. And the mass of the Earth also affects how stable the tilt of the Earth's rotation axis is. And the tilt of the Earth's rotation axis also, as I said, depends on the presence of a moon. It also is sensitive to where Jupiter is in the solar system. So it's a complex web. You change one factor a little bit to try to make a habitable planetary system uh, because it say it doesn't have one factor correct, quite right. You think you can just change one factor? Well, you can't because if you change one factor, then you affect other things. It's like a spider web. You touch one part and the whole thing vibrates. So what we're learning in astrobiology, and this is very recent actually, is that the conditions of life are not only rare, but they're specific. And if you want to see where this diagram came from and uh, understand what these little boxes mean, I wrote a review paper uh, called Habitable Zones in the Universe uh, in 2005 that you can look up in the journal Origins of Life and Evolutions of Biospheres. Now this leads us with a dilemma. We know we live in a very big universe with lots of stars, and lots of galaxies. So we have very many probabilistic resources. So how do we tell of a planet if a habitable planet like the Earth, for example, is a result of chance or design. Okay, we know there are lots of other stars with lots of planets orbiting around them. We're discovering planets around other stars today. Over 260 are known now. And they all have different properties. Are there enough planets so that by chance you get one planetary system having just the right set of properties uh, to have a habitable planet? That's the question. Let me illustrate the dilemma this way. Suppose I had a quarter and I flipped it 20 times and I got 20 heads in a row. What would you think about that quarter? Either it's a two-headed 
quarter, <laughs> or I practice really well at flipping coins so I can always get ahead, heads every time I flip it. But you know it's rigged. There's something going on there. Now suppose in the second case, now second experiment, I locked the doors in this room. And I said, nobody's going to leave this room until I get 20 heads in a row and I started flipping a coin. And after a few hours, people start dozing off. After a few days, perhaps some people pass out. <laughs> and then eventually, I get 20 heads in a row, let's say after a million flips. Say so I can do it really fast. Uh, then what would you think? Would you think the coin was rigged or not? No, not in that case, because the probabilistic resources are much expanded in that second case. So if I, if I, if I had 20, if I had a million attempts at uh, 20 heads in a row, well, then there's a pretty good chance that I might get it once then. So that's what I mean about the universe. And so getting 20 heads in a row, for example, is like getting a habitable planet. The thing is, we don't know the probabilistic, the probabilities well enough yet to make that decision, to decide whether the habitability of the Earth is a result of chance or if it's rigged. Let me illustrate this again with an, another example. Let's just say for the sake of argument that there are 13 astronomical factors. You might call them habitability factors. Okay, you might say uh, the right kind of star. Let's say there's a 10% chance or 1 in 10 chance that you can pick the right kind of star for life uh, in our galaxy just by chance. And there's a 10% chance that uh, that star that you picked would have a terrestrial planet orbiting it. And there's a 10% chance that that terrestrial planet is in the circumstellar habitable zone, and so on. And just for the sake of argument, let's just say those are independent, just for simplicity. So you multiply those out, and you get about 10 to the minus 13. Okay, so there's a one chance in 10 to the 13th that you'll pick a planet that's habitable. But we have to multiply by the probabilistic resources of the galaxy. There are about 10 to the, 10 to the 11th power stars, 100 billion stars or so, in the Milky Way galaxy. So we multiply those out, and so there's roughly a 1% chance of having just one habitable planet in the Milky Way. Now, this is just for illustration purposes. Actually, I think 10% is far too big a probability for a number of these factors. Uh, but there are about 10 to the 11th galaxies in the observable universe. Okay. And so we're at the point where it could go either way with the probabilities. Possibly chance could explain... Uh, the high level of habitability of the Earth, even though we know already that it's very rare. Earth-like planets are exceedingly rare in the universe. That we know enough about. We just can't say we're unique. Okay. It could turn out in the next few decades, as we learn more in astrobiology, uh, that even in the observable universe, there aren't enough stars to account uh, for this one extremely habitable planet. That's a possibility. But we're not quite there yet. So I don't want to overstate my case. So chance still has a, room to, a lot of room to operate. And so just saying that Earth-like planets are rare is not enough to infer design or say that our situation is rigged. So we need a, some, some other evidence, a kind of tiebreaker, to decide if we're the result of chance or design. And that's what we present in our book, The Privileged Planet, How Our Place in the Cosmos is Designed for Discovery, which I co-authored with Jay Richards, who will be here tomorrow. To put it succinctly and somewhat technically, the basic thesis of our argument can be boiled down to this one short sentence, which is habitability correlates with measurability, which is my idea for originally for the title of the book, uh, or the correlation between habitability and measurability, which sounds more like a paper title, but Jay came up with this much better title, The Privileged Planet. And to put it somewhat uh, less technically, we argue that the same narrow circumstances that allow us to exist also provide us with the best overall setting for making scientific discoveries. Or in other words, the very conditions that make Earth hospitable to intelligent life also make it well suited to viewing and analyzing the universe as a whole. Now, to present the case, we have a number of examples. Uh, from different specialties in the sciences. Each of these is a different chapter in the book. And I wish I could go over all these today, uh, but it would take me several hours. So I, I'm only going to pick three of these to illustrate how this works. And so I'll talk about eclipses, solar eclipses. 
our, our place in the galaxy and our place in cosmic history, our place in cosmic time, to illustrate this thesis. Argument is completely empirical, by the way. So we look out at nature and we just notice these correlations, these patterns. In fact, uh, I discovered this as a result of uh, going to India in 1995 and observing a total eclipse of the sun. I participated with an uh, expedition from the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Bangalore, India, and they invited me uh, to go on the eclipse, uh, scientific eclipse team with them. And so I made some meteorological measurements uh, during the solar eclipse and also took some photographs, including this one, showing the corona around the sun, which becomes visible uh, during eclipse uh, when the moon covers up the bright photosphere of the sun. But this was also 